Father, we just thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to get it. Your word to us in the name of Jesus. We're open to you, Lord. We need you. Help us. We cry out to you. You know exactly what's going on. You know the situations that we're in and what we face. Speak your word. would be that after these several weeks of study from God's Word that we'll see something um, that we've never seen and, and be able to grow in a way uh, that we haven't grown. So overcoming the obstacle, and this is part two, and Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. <clears throat> so I want you to notice this. You can go ahead and put it up for me until I connect. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And so we want to talk today about overcoming the obstacle of self. I had thought when I ministered that message last week that I'd be done with it and today we would go into history. But something happened last week in prayer that took me in a different direction for today. And I, I just want to show you again how to overcome the obstacle of self. Um, in this part of the country, in Houston, this time of year, weeds seem like they're growing everywhere. And uh, of course, there was a TV commercial that I got really, really excited about. Scott's uh, fertilizer came out with a new brand or a new kind of fertilizer for your lawn. I've heard about, maybe you've heard about weed and feed. You know, you go out right now and you really have to have the lawn man come. Not as much because the grass is going, if your grass is dormant, it's not growing. But you have to have the lawn man come because the weeds are growing. I mean, you got weeds growing in the lawn, in the beds, in the cracks, and, you know, that has to be dealt with. And really, when you talk about Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 15, he's talking about a root of bitterness that springs up, it pops up. And you can cut it off, but if you haven't dealt with the roof, it's going to keep potting, popping up. Well, Scott's fertilizer has a turf builder triple action that just came out. Not only will it kill the weeds, it'll prevent fire ants for up to six months. It'll chemically treat your lawn, and then on top of that, it'll feed your lawn and strengthen it against heat and against drought. Well, Pastor Stan or Pastor Scott is going to give you some spirit builder, triple action, word of God today. <laughs> I'm going to give you something that will kill the roots of bitterness on the inside. I'm going to give you something from the Word of God that will prevent future problems from propping up and being reinfected in your life. And I'm going to feed and strengthen your spirit so that future hurts won't be a problem. <laughs> so, in this, uh, there are four things that I want to show you about overcoming the obstacle. Four things about overcoming the obstacle. We're going to say, I need to add a week. I said it was a four-week series. So number one, um, overcome the, and I'm on a slide, so you can advance with me. Um, number one, overcome the obstacle of self. And really what you're going to clearly see today, you and of yourself are not a problem, but if something is in you that's not good, it will cause you to trip yourself up. In other words, 
you've got to learn how to get out of your own way. And so if something is growing in you because of things that have happened and you don't deal with it, it, man it really is a, a, a bitterness in you. And we'll see today that it's not just anger but unhappiness. Number two, we'll talk about this next time, is history. Past history will keep you from the future that God has. It'll keep you from experiencing a better life. Number three is Babel, which is going to be about communication. And that's huge. I, I look forward to that. And then number four, uh, we're going to talk about overcoming the obstacle of money. Lack of money or the abundance of money the enemy will use to trip you up from experiencing the life that God has for you. And we'll see that when we have time. Amen? But I want to talk today specifically because I was in prayer. I, I was leading the prayer conference call. And I almost began to weep while I was praying because I was praying for you. And I started praying through the message that we preached last week. I was praying for people that because of a root of bitterness were dealing with anger. But then I also started to pray for people in the congregation, whether it be members or visitors, that were dealing with unhappiness. And I, I had a burden of prayer in that moment that there were some that we were actually praying for without me knowing it, that in their life right now, they're really, really not happy. And from that, I began to see something that I didn't see at first in the book of Genesis. So as we start this week, I want to look at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 6. Obviously, you know the story in Genesis. This is Cain and Abel, and Cain brought an offering to the Lord, and Abel brought his offering, and God accepted the offering that, Cain, that Abel brought, but he didn't accept. He didn't say that he rejected it. He just didn't accept it, which is a form of rejection. But then you know immediately that, that God didn't, you know, wasn't done with him because God immediately came to Cain and said, hey, what's going on? In verse 6, he specifically, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Because he got so upset because Abel's offering was accepted. And we said to you last week that, 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 that God is asking him this question to help him, not to hurt him. He's trying to help him because if he doesn't deal with this thing, it's going to cause some serious problems. God literally said to him, sin is crouching at the door, and if you don't get a hold of this, you're going to end up doing something that you're going to later regret. He asked him a second question. He said, why has your countenance fallen? So what I saw last week that I ministered to you was that one of the questions that will help you get down to identify and see if there is a root of bitterness in you is when you're angry. Stop and ask yourself, why are you angry? But what I didn't see was the importance of the second question that God asked. Why has your countenance fallen? What I prayed and what came out of me and what came to me as a revelation was, why are you unhappy? That God was asking him specifically to, and I'll show you from the scripture that it was, he was asking, because, you know, why does your countenance fall? The New Living Translation says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? So in other words, you can tell on the outside something's not right on the inside. And what I submit to you is he was simply asking, why are you so unhappy? What about this situation makes you unhappy? Because if, if he can identify that and then get it out of his life, then it won't trip him up and cause him to do something that he would later regret. I personally believe that unhappiness is the number one cause of divorce. If you've ever known anybody that's been married and they got divorced or are faced with divorce or have known somebody close to them that has been divorced, in reality, I personally believe that the number one cause of divorce is not money. I mean, if you Google it, you'll find that, you know, today it might be money and tomorrow it might be, you know, something that didn't go right sexually, you know, some, some, you know something happened. 
but truthfully, irrespective of the causes. What caused that person to pull the trigger and say, I'm done with this, or literally to murder the marriage, is unhappiness. And it became so strong that they said, I'm not happy, and I just can't do this anymore. We find ourselves in that place, not just where marriages is concerned, but, you know, where our job is concerned. If you're driving to work and you dread going to work, there's a, it, 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 you know, why are you so unhappy? It's a critical thing. It's so much so that you'll leave a good paying job, a, a, a job that's supporting your family, and, and, and you know, and all you got to do is just keep going to work. I know you're unhappy about it, but if you keep going to work, I mean, you know, these other things will be taken care of, but, but you let unhappiness reach a critical level, and you'll walk away from a job. You'll walk away from a church. You knew when you came that this is where God wants you to be, but, but something happened. Well, for whatever reason, now you're in a place, in that place, and you're not happy. And if you don't watch that, you'll leave where God wants you to be because it just reached a critical level. It's that way with money. I mean, it shouldn't be that a grown person has to go to their mom or dad to ask them to help them financially. And I can imagine that going through or being in that situation where you got to ask your kids or you got to go here or go there. And, you know, you expected that by this time in your life that you would be in a better place. And that, if you don't watch it, can cause some serious unhappiness in your life. I don't know, but probably suicide is ultimately the result of a person who's not happy. People drown their sorrows in substances to escape. So I want to back up to Hebrews 12 and minister this to you as I received it. So today we're going to talk about overcoming the obstacle of self, specifically overcoming the obstacle of bitterness, because when there is a root of bitterness in your heart, it'll manifest one of two ways particularly. It'll show up as anger, or, and it can show up as unhappiness. Watch this. So he says, look diligently. Now this is a command. He's telling you and every one of us that we need to look diligently unless we fall short of the grace of God. And we said it last week. We can't afford to fall short of the grace of God because it is by his grace that we receive everything good that we receive from God. We don't merit it. We can't pray hard enough. We can't serve long enough to earn God doing something good in our lives. Anything God gives you is by grace. Somebody said, but by the grace of God. But by the grace of God. Amen. And so the, re the reality of it is, he says, you need to look very carefully because even though it's unmerited, it's not based on what you do or don't do, there is something in you that can trip you up and keep you from reaching and walking and being in the grace of God. What is it? He goes on and he says, look diligently unless any root of bitterness in you springs up, troubles you, and thereby anybody, the other people are defiled. So unequivocally, the root of bitterness will cause you to fall short of the grace of God. And you may say, I'm not a bitter person. I, I don't, you know, I don't see myself as a bitter person. Or and you can say, you know, I'm not really an angry person. I don't I have a good control over my temper and, you know, I don't have angry outbursts at the people that I'm, I'm closest to. But the question that the Lord brought me to for you to minister to you is are you happy or why are you unhappy with and in the areas that you're in so you know say well how do you get all of that out of the word bitterness well let's talk about it so a uh, long time ago there was this person named T.B. Wilson I don't know if she's alive today I hope that she is because you know she wasn't that old 20 years ago and she had wrote a book and in the book she described a revelation about bitterness the revelation was very simple. God showed her in a dream that 
bitterness is betrayal's baby. In other words, in your heart, when betrayal happened, a baby was born. I remember vividly, she describes in the book, that it's the, the, she was in a room, and there was a fireplace, and there was clocks on the mantel, and they were all stuck on one period of time. And the Lord showed her that those clocks referred to moments in time where somebody did something, somebody close to them, that did something negative, and they didn't expect it. They can remember that moment. Bitterness is betrayal's baby. It's, it's, it's when someone close to you did something that you didn't expect. You could simplify it and say that bitterness is the result of failed expectation. You know, you got married and you didn't expect that person to do that. And the moment that they did it, it hurt you. And it has an effect on your life. It, it sowed a seed of bitterness. Now you're really bitter about that. It, you know, things happen. You know, there's some people today, and we're really reaching for people that are unchurched, that don't know the Lord, but also for people that are de-churched. They were in church, but something happened that they didn't expect by people close to them. And as a result, they became bitter, and they've been removed from that place. Bitterness is the result of failed expectation. So make sure you understand, in that moment, something bad happened. That negative seed was sown, and now from time to time, um, things will pop up, and you'll get really upset, or you'll get really, really sad, and the, 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 the unhappiness is not the root, it's really the fruit. But in order to really get it out of your, of your life, you've got to get down to why are you unhappy? Let's look at it in Genesis chapter 40. And just leave it right, uh, go back, I mean, if I want to leave it blank, I want to set it up. So in Genesis chapter 40, this is the story of Joseph. Now, I, you know, I don't know what situation you're in with your family. But I don't believe it got as bad as it got for them. He had a dream, and you might be here like me, and you've got dreams to live a better life. But things didn't happen the way that you expected, and here you are. Well, sh uh, how far back did we go? Okay, there it is. So uh, as, you, as the story goes, uh, in Genesis chapter 40, I mean, his brothers sold him out. For what? I mean, his father favored him. I mean, it wasn't his fault. And he had a dream. God gave him the dream. That wasn't his fault. Yeah, maybe he was a braggart. Maybe he, you know, taunted them or whatever. But was it deserving of death? They were talking about killing him. And then one of them said, well, well, you know, I'll come back and get him later. And then somebody else said, well, no, let's just sell him into slavery and then, 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 then take some blood and tell dad that he died. All of that is really, really bad. You think if anybody could be bitter, it would be Joseph. And that's why I want to meet him when I get to heaven. Because of how he handled life in really bad situations. And then above all that, so he gets sold into slavery, right? But then he, he goes to Potiphar's house, and he becomes uh, promoted. He's over everything that pertains to Potiphar. And sure enough, somebody lied on him to the boss. Because you might be here, and you're bitter because of what's going on with the boss or on the job. People lying on you. People making this out to be and so forth and so on. Sure enough, I mean, the boss fired him and put him in prison as a result of it. You think he'd be sitting in that the story that we're about to read would be and Joseph was in prison and he was so sad. The dream that he thought was never going to come to pass and he was dejected and God had to send a prophet to him in the prison to encourage him and build him up. No, that ain't the story. I believe the story is the way it is because he looked diligently to his heart and he didn't let things that could have made him bitter be planted in him he kept it out 
There were two other guys that were in jail that he, he had interaction with. One day, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 40 that, that uh, Joseph came in, uh, verse 6, uh, that when Joseph came into them, in the morning he looked at these two guys and he saw that they were sad. He what? Saw that they were sad. Sure enough, he comes in and he sees that they're sad. And the next verse says, he, so he asked these guys who were with him in the custody of the Lord's house, saying, why do you look so sad today? When I was praying this week and immediately I began, I saw something that I missed to give you on last week. This is the question that the Lord brought to my heart. And I searched it and I found that there's a story in the Bible where, God, where, where somebody was asked, why are you so sad? I submit to you that the question that God asked to Cain at that moment to help him, to keep him from doing something that he shouldn't do, is the same question that he's asking. Why are you so sad? He asked him, yeah, why are you so angry? But the second question, why is your countenance falling? Joseph came in, and they looked different than they did at other times. There was something about their countenance. Their countenance was falling. I mean, you would think that their answer would be, what do you mean? We're all in jail. You ought to be sad too. But you going around, Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky, doesn't matter. Anything, yeah, it's, it doesn't matter. You just... <laughs> and there are people like that. And you can be like that. That no matter the situation... Remember, people are not your problem. Yeah, but pastor, you don't know the, the, the person that I'm married to. You don't know the things that they have done. You don't work at the place where I work. You don't go to church where I do go to church where you go to church. <laughs> what are you trying to say about the church? You, you don't know. I should, but the reality, it's not people that are your problem. It's how you process what people do. That's your problem. So Joseph asked him, why are you so sad today? Why do you look so sad? There was something about their countenance that caused them to look a certain way. Like I said, one of the biggest problems that people deal with today is acute unhappiness. I believe God gave me this message because there might be someone here that, whether it be in your marriage, on your job, where your children are concerned, where your church is concerned, where your attitude about the government is concerned, where you are about money, that really, and if you get past the surface, folks, be honest with yourself. You might not be in a position to show me that you're sad. And you may be even so protective of yourself because the person that, that's around you has hurt you before that you don't even show them that you're sad. But don't lie to yourself. If you're be like the doctor, the next Dr. Phil. <laughs> right? I mean, that guy's like a multi, multi, multi-millionaire, right? I mean, we're talking about some intimate stuff, like the next Oprah, but on the, like a guy, a guy Oprah. <laughs> but really, you, only you, nobody knows you like you know you. And I just want to show you from the word how to identify what's causing that real unhappiness so you can get it out. Because until you get it out, it's going to keep coming in. It's going to hold you back from the better life that God has for you. Will you all let me minister to you today? So in other words, anger and unhappiness are just the fruit, not the root. There is a reason why you are so unhappy. Go with me to Nehemiah chapter uh, 2. I didn't even know that Nehemiah had anything about this subject. And I even, I didn't stumble upon it because I know this is the Holy Spirit. 
But I, I typed in two words, so sad, because I was looking for the word that I did know from Joseph. I did know that Joseph went in and said, why are you so sad? I've heard that minister before. That's why it's so important for you to put yourself in position of hearing anointed messages, because they'll give you tools to overcome in life, as we're about to see. But this one I did not know. This one is from the Holy Spirit directly to you. Give an ear to hear what the Spirit of God says to you. In Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1, it came to pass in the month of Nisan. I didn't know that Nisan was in the Bible. Oh, in the 20th year of this king, when wine was before him, that I, Nehemiah, took the wine and gave it to the king. So I want you to imagine in that day, the prophet and others served the king. And so Nehemiah is serving the king, and he took wine and gave it to the king. That was his service. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. The next verse says in verse 2, Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. And said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? I want to talk to you from this passage. I didn't know that this was even in the Bible. And again, the question comes, why are you so sad? He, the king, was able to identify it because his countenance had fallen. Now, he had never been like that before. He was able to mask it. And maybe in your marriage, you've been able to mask the sadness. Maybe on the job or maybe where the children are concerned or maybe where the money is concerned, you're able to hide it, but not this day. It sprung up. Oh, man, I'm preaching good. You caught me at a moment. It looks like I'm, I'm upset because the car got scratched. Well, and I'm upset because the car got scratched and we broke. So we can't get it fixed. Because when you got more than enough and plenty beside, oh, that's not a big deal. But now, because you're unhappy about where you are financially, it's a big deal. Now I'm going off on you about something that can be, can be repaired. I'm willing to talk to you in such a demeaning way because you did something that can be fixed. But because I'm unhappy about where we are financially, I'm hurting you. I'm trying. There's a root of bitterness. Why are you so sharp? Why are you so sad? It's the question. So he couldn't hide it that day. And then he responds like, why shouldn't I be sad? <laughs> And he names three different reasons why. What I want to show you is that there is a reason why you are sad. And you've got to get down to it. You've got to be able to name it and say, this is why. It's, it's not the small thing. It's this reason. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, I'm going to close with this. This is the good part, so if you feel heavy right now, just hang on. <laughs> this feels like an unhappy service. <laughs> if you could go back and not show the scripture, I want to set it up. Um, in first, just push the back button. It'll take you back. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we have the story of Elkanah and Hannah. Hannah is going to be the mom of a prophet. And Elkanah goes to the temple, and Eli, the priest, or is it a priest? He's the prophet or the priest, I can't remember, but Eli was in the temple, so he had to be the priest at the time. And every year they go up to the temple, and you know, it was a kind of a big deal. People traveled to get there, and so now you're around friends and loved ones. And as the story went, Elkanah 
was married to Hannah, but Hannah didn't have kids. Remember what or where unhappiness comes from. Don't forget that. It comes from bitterness. Bitterness comes from failed expectations. And for her, they had gotten married and she expected that now that we're married, we can have children. That, I mean, how many of y'all know that's norm? And for most people, they get married, they want to have kids. And, but it didn't work that way for them. And they went year after year and she didn't get pregnant. And that failed expectation caused a seed to be planted and a root to grow. Bitterness was the result. A failed expert. I know what that's like. My wife and I, when we first got married, she didn't immediately get pregnant. And I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> looking forward to having some boys running around the house. And went to the doctor and found out that, you know, the, she had the symptoms of, of some disease that would prevent her from having babies. Y'all know we got two kids, so this is a good story. <laughs> this is a good story, y'all. We didn't let that failed expectation month after month. Well, I might be pregnant. Oh, no, I'm not. Well, I might be pregnant. It's 31 days. Oh, no, never mind. I'm not. We could have let that failed expectation. It's been, it's been a while now. The doctors say that it's impossible. And if you don't watch, that can cause you an unhappy. I can remember seeing other people with kids. I mean, my brother's got five kids, so I'm like always around them. How come I can't have one that looks like one of them? <laughs> I like them kids. You know, the failed expectation, I expected by this time in my life I would be married. I expected that this time in my life that I'd be a certain way. Not only that, but people closest to Hannah talked down to her, talked bad to her. Made her feel bad. I mean, I can remember my mom and dad is like, you know, come on, boy. You know, we need some grandkids. <laughs> they put pressure, and that would cause this unhappiness. As the story goes, one day they're going up, and her husband notices that she is really sad. I mean, really sad. He speaks up in verse 8, and he says to her, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why are you crying? Why are you not eating? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now watch this. These are relevant questions, realistic. But at the same time, they're unrealistic expectations if you know me as you're supposed to, being my husband. You ought to know why I'm crying. You ought to know why I'm not eating normally. And you ought to know why my heart is grieved. And matter of fact, you know, pity likes a party. You ought to be crying with me. You ought to not be you sitting up there eating that whole meal. You ought to be grieved like I'm grieved. You don't want it as bad as I do. And now it's a problem between them. He's obviously in a good place. He's like, am I not better than you than having 10 sons? He had obviously must have been really, really good to his wife. And I'm here to tell you that God is really, really good to you. You do not let the, the, the situation that you're in, you don't have to let it get in you. Because love, if you know God, will never leave you in a bad situation. And if it feels like you're in a really, really bad situation right now where you feel like crying, you don't have to cry. You could be just like Joseph. He was like, hey, how y'all doing? Why are y'all so sad? <laughs> you don't have to let it get on the inside of you. He asked her three relevant questions. Why are you crying? There's a reason why you're crying. She's crying because she's unhappy. Why are you not eating? Let's talk about it. Under eating and overeating are problems. She wasn't eating, but there are some people, because of what's going on on the inside of them, they overeat. They look in the mirror, they don't like what they see. That's just the surface. Why are you that way? 
Get down to the root of it. Something happened. A failed expectation, and you became bitter. And a lot of times, there's no way, you, you didn't need to eat that quart of ice cream. No one person should eat a quart of ice cream in one sitting. But what are you doing? You're trying to mask. You're trying, <laughs> trying, to, trying to cover something up. Why is your heart grieved? There is a reason. So we go on to the next verse. I'm almost close. This is the third occasion in which God is confirming to us that the real two questions, if you're going to get down to the root, watch these two questions in your life. Why am I angry? If you find yourself really, really upset about something, pause, walk away. Why am I upset about this? This woman loves me. Why, is, why am I upset that she didn't do this? If you, if you slow down, and particularly if you ask the Lord to help you, because God will show you you. Yeah. Like nobody can show you you. <laughs> nobody knows you like you know you, but God can show you. Why? Second question, why are you so unhappy? Stop dealing with just the top. Get down to the root. So in 1 Samuel, this woman couldn't even answer her husband. She was so overwhelmed with sadness. You know it because in verse 10, she said to him, <clears throat> or uh, the Bible says of her, that she was in bed. She couldn't answer him. She couldn't communicate to her husband, the closest person to her, because she was in bitterness of soul. If this doesn't confirm it for you, then go back and listen to this, this tape again or this message again because it's obvious. From Hebrews 12 where he says, look for a root of bitterness, back to Genesis 4 where he said, why is your, fa your face fallen? To Genesis chapter 40 where he says, why are you so sad? To me, Nehemiah chapter 2, is like, why are you so sad? I mean, this is confirming. And he says to her in 1 Samuel, why are you so sad? It's the bitterness of the soul. The soul is the mind, the will and the emotions. That's why she can't communicate to you the way that she needs to and wants to, because it's deep. Why are you weeping? Because I'm in anguish. You see that? Because I'm in anguish. I can't talk to you, it's too deep. But the good part about this is that she prayed to the Lord. She didn't just stay in the bitterness of soul. She did one thing that I want to encourage you to do. She's in bitterness. I want you to imagine. She's just like, God, I need you to help me. I'm in a real bad way right now. I can't even talk to my husband. And what's going on in me is now messing me up with him. God, I need you to help me. The good news is, folks, he did. The Bible says in Psalms 107, 20, and he, he's no respecter of persons. If he did this for others, he will do this for you. And when you cry out to the Lord, he will answer you. And he'll show you great and mighty things that you know not. He sent his word and healed her and delivered her from all of her destructions. Rather than divorcing Elkanah for whatever reason and giving up hopes on her future, God gave her a word. When you read your chapter this week, read it slow. Because what you'll find is right after she prayed to the Lord, the man of God got a word and an unction from the Lord.
she got this prophetic word. Take your time and read it. And that's really what you need. Whatever it is, work-related, church-related, government, money, children, marriage, it fits us all because it's God's word for us. He'll give you a word that even those situations look absolutely impossible. I have no idea in my mind how we as a small congregation are going to build a six to seven million dollar building in multiple locations. But God's got big things planned. And he's beyond our ability. That's what makes him God. And what he's done for others, he'll do for us. If there are other debt-free ministries, then God's no respect it. We'll be a debt-free ministry. We don't need to go to a bank and ask them for a loan to help us build a building. We don't need to twist people's arm. God can move on one man or one woman, and we can be starting it real soon. Praise God. We've got to learn to have a spirit of faith. When you get a word from God that something belongs to you, that something is rightfully yours, that's all you need. It could look like giants. It could look like walled cities. But all you need is one word from God. She got that word from the Lord. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way. She ate and her face was no longer sad. She went from unhappy to happy with one word from God. She went from unhappy being sad to being happy with one visit to Faith Family Church. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Her face was no longer sad, and at that moment, she wasn't pregnant. At that moment, ain't nothing changed. She didn't feel anything, but she just took it by faith. She said, well, I didn't eat before. Well, I'm going to eat now. Well, I wasn't doing this before. Well, I would She went her way. No longer was she doing something somebody else's way. She started to just be who she is. She enjoyed the woman that she was, and she got back to that happy place. Come on and stand up on your feet. Oh, I done preached myself happy today. Glory be to our great God. This is good, y'all, because we don't have to stay in an unhappy state. Pray to the Lord. Get on our conference call. Don't, it, he'll show you. He'll help you get down to the root of it. Pray to him. He'll answer you. He'll give you exactly what you need, and you will be the better before. So how do you overcome unhappiness? Let's make sure you got it. Number one, get down to the root. I'm not unhappy because the child broke the glass. I took time and I found out it was because of what happened to me with me when I was a child that causes me such unhappiness. Once you identify that the root, get it out of there. Come on. How do you get milk out of, the, out of a cup? You turn the water on and you let the water run in there and it'll displace the milk that's in the bottom of the cup. How do you get bad things that happen and the failed expectations that took place? How do you get those hurtful things out of your heart? Keep running the word of God on the inside of you and it'll drive those things out of you. Then what do you do? You medicate it. Get some of that Scott's triple action prevent up to six months fire ants from biting you. Come on. Medicate it with the word and then lastly, leave it alone. We'll pick up here next time on history. But how many of y'all thank God for this word today? Amen. Bless you, Facebook. Thank you all for being here today. We'll see you next time. Amen. Will you bow your head?